while reading up on the incredible work of our panellist Christina Ryan, I came across mention of her grandma, Edna Ryan. <laughs> Edna was one of this country's leading feminists in much the same way that Susan Ryan, no relation, was a role model to my generation of women. Edna was a role model to Susan's. A determined activist, she's credited with helping to achieve equal pay for women in this country. The various men who were head of departments used to forget I wasn't a bloke in some ways. And I remember the auditor who had a staff of about six had put on a, a young woman and he said, oh, we really shouldn't employ the, the girls because they start wanting equal pay. He told me this. Wonderful to see Edna there, Christina. Um, I noted from her biography, she was at the first International Women's Day in Sydney. It was organised by the militant women's movement of the Communist Party of Australia uh, at Sydney's domain. What propelled a 24-year-old woman along to the domain for that occasion? Well, she was probably a member of the Communist Party at the time, <laughs> Ellen. Uh, so I suspect she, she may have gone in that context. Um, but Edna had a, a profound sense, and it's it's really a multi-generational thing in our family, um, of social justice. And uh, she was an activist from when she was a kid, and that was probably a natural progression of that. It, it was quite um, interesting because, uh, you know, she used the mechanisms that were available to her, and that was one of them. Hmm. You um, told go me... Go there and see if we can get some outcomes, yeah. and she tried that. And yeah. 46 years later, and we'll come to that part, she got a result. Mm. Um, <laughs> what <laughs> was it about um, her parents and her siblings and the sort of work they did that made her so aware of, of the need to fight for women's right to work and for, for equal pay to do it? Uh, she was uh, born in a very large family, Edna had. I had six great aunts uh, alive when I was young, um, plus Edna. So there were seven of them. We'd, we'd go on trips on the Manly Ferry. It was fantastic. Um, they were all born in Piermont. Back in the days when Piermont wasn't a flash part of Sydney, it was actually um, an incredibly poor area. And her father was a merchant seaman who was rarely home. And her mother had to go out and work to make sure that she could feed the 12 children. Her sisters, um, who were all older than her, uh, went out to work as soon as they were able to make sure that the family could survive. They were all seamstresses, except my one uh, great aunt, Vic, Auntie Vic, um, Victoria, who was a tailor. And tailors uh, were men. Tailors were always men. So the fact that Auntie Vic was a tailor was astonishing because it meant she got a man's wages mm. way back then. Um, and that really showed up back in those days that women were paid and women's jobs were paid at a very different rate to men's jobs and men's work. And I guess that, and so, that, that seeded her interest right through till 1974 when she wrote the critical submission uh, to the national wage case so that women could get the same minimum wage case for men. She actually worked out the number of uh, women leading households and, and persuaded the commissioner. Um, Sue Lett, we asked you a similar question and, and you sent us a, a picture of Lucy Palmer, who was your surrogate grandmother. There she is, and she's from the Midwest of the United States. But yes. Sue Lett, she's got a skin that says Queensland to me. What? <laughs> <laughs> what is, tell me the, the mystery there. Uh, well, that's because she spent a lot of her life in the sun in the tropics. So she was a painter. She was um, one of the first uh, painters who did underwater painting. Uh, her husband was a naturalist and they traveled all over the world. And while he was diving, doing his naturalist research, she would go down wearing sort of 1940s, 20,000 leagues under the sea, you know, eight, 80 pound metal um, hood and a hose to the surface with a compressor and she would have weighted sneakers and easel and special canvas and she would paint. She painted the Great Barrier Reef, she painted um, all over the South Pacific and uh, they were actually on a National Geographic trip to live in the Sulu Islands um, and the Sulu Archipelago for a number of months. That was a very exciting and challenging time. It's an area that for more than 100 years has been filled with militancy and fighting and all the rest of it. And so she described to me once how she would wake up in the middle of the night to gunshots and, uh, and then get up in the morning and go dive and paint underwater. Yeah, we're seeing a picture that goes through here and it's, it's a woman 
uh, with a large uh, basket full of yellow flowers and she's bearing it along. You told us a beautiful story that she repainted that for you because you wanted it so much, that painting that you couldn't have. How so difficult was it for her to do that for you? So difficult. That painting is called Walking Flower Basket. And, uh, and it was actually painted in Mexico. It was a, a woman who was carrying her, her goods to market. Um, and the painting is quite symbolic. It has a meaning, which is that there are these beautiful things, but often beautiful things are carried on the back of women as a heavy burden. Um, we are, in a sense, the burden carriers in many ways. Uh, and uh, that painting uh, she painted when she was a bit younger. But as she aged, she got macular degeneration. That's a kind of uh, blindness where you have the middle of your vision is a black hole and you can only have peripheral vision. I had wanted that painting and my mother and father wanted to get it for me as a graduation present, but her relative who owned it wouldn't sell it. So she spent six months carefully copying the painting using only her peripheral vision so that um, it could be given to me as a graduation present, best present ever. Wonderful. What a wonderful story. Mm. Amy Ramikis, um, uh, you had to have a wonderful story with uh, uh, Ramikis as a surname. Tell me about your Oma. Uh, Oma Tatiana, uh, she is a refugee. She was related to the aristocracy and lost everything uh, during World War One, or in the lead up to it when Stalin did his thing. But just kind of, you know, picked herself up. She lost children, but, you know, managed to save my father and just turned into this just incredible force of nature who, despite losing her home multiple times in disasters, losing husbands, sometimes by choice, other times by not, uh, and, and losing her country, just continued to just fight things her way. So she would yell at police whenever she had the opportunity to do that. <laughs> constantly you know calling people fascists whenever <laughs> the, the um, attitude took her uh, and she was just wonderful the most wonderful person I've ever ever known but I, I remembered she never wrote anything down she had terrible arthritis so everything was passed on just by her showing to us and she'd made this Lithuanian liqueur and every Lithuanian ha family has their own recipe for this thing so I had to try and recreate it and it took years and I finally got the taste and when I did, I was like, this tastes really familiar. And I realized it was what she called special milk, which is what when I was being a little hyperactive, she would give me to put me to sleep. So she had been drugging me from the time I was about three years old. Oh, my God. Lithuanian liqueur is like 95% proof, right? It really is. You can't actually buy the alcohol they use in Australia because it's illegal. <laughs> Lucy. What a story! What a story! Well, my grandmother never was never never did that for me. Gosh, what might have been quite fun if she had. Um, but she, but my grandmother was very much older. She was born, I think, in the 1890s or, or very early 20th century, and she was born in England. And she met my grandfather when he was fighting as a, a pilot in the Royal Air Force in the First World War. And he was, I think, he was did a bit bit of sort of um, you know heroic pir you know, piloting, and he fought he fought the Red Baron's brother and shot Ooh. him down. And he so he was he was obviously quite a I would say possibly quite a dashing uh, pilot. And um, anyway, they met in an airfield in Gloucestershire, and she was an English woman, and they must have fallen in love because she came back to Australia with him, with her sister who who, who lived a lot longer than she did, Auntie Mim. And she was she, that, that pair of women. They were quite formidable in their time. That she came, they both came to Australia. Obviously, uh, she had four children. My my dad's the eldest one, born in 1923. He turned 97 yesterday, but um, you know had four kids. But also set up um, a business like a, a, a guest house and a restaurant in Well Beach called Jonas, Very which, is, well which is like a prominent thing now. Quite mm -hmm. a different thing. It was quite modest and low-key but it was very beautiful so there she was, was a businesswoman well she she, she was i don't, I don't think she do. decided to be a businesswoman but i think she loved being busy and i think it yeah. helped mim kind of have something to do then later in the in the um you know in the late 50s early 60s she st set up a business in threadbow when the when the skiing industry was just developing so when i knew her when you know she died when i was only six in 1964 but she was this formidable woman and there weren't many women in that era mm. you know building you know 
snow goods businesses in Threadbow. I mean, that was a bit off piece. <laughs> and it was because she was asthmatic. But, you know, good for her. She was a bit of a, a pioneer. Yeah. And I don't think she would have ever seen herself as a pioneer. But, in fact, she was. Yeah. And she was pretty amazing. Christina, let's finally go back to you. We've only got about 30 seconds. But you said you didn't go to university. You did uh, women's studies with your grandmother, Edna Ryan, which I think I gives you any, any honorary yeah. degree you like. You just did two or three <laughs> sentences real quick. Tell me, what did she teach you about courage? Look, I learned this from Edna and my other mentors, which who were equally formidable women. Um, stick with it. You do the thing that you do and you make it work and you don't let anyone get in the way. But the thing she used to say was, don't worry about the men, Christina. They'll look out for themselves. <laughs> we need to do stuff for us. And I think we need to as women, and it's lovely to be on an all-women panel today, just, just remember that yeah. you know, women of courage are the ones who change the world fundamentally. Oh, wow.